Hello, welcome to COM 108, Communications and Social Interaction. Today we're going to be covering Chapter 9, Part 1, Conflict and Communication. So let's start off with the definition of conflict, which involves interaction and interdependence of people. Interaction, meaning conflicts are created and sustained through verbal and nonverbal communication. Interdependence, meaning people involved in conflict, are in a situation where they must rely on each other, need each other, and or are in a relationship with each other. So it can be a situation at work, it can be a situation at home, it can be a situation where two people have to work together even in a classroom and there is some sort of dependence upon each other to get the job done. It involves perception. It arises due to incompatible goals. It is inevitable and can involve individuals or groups. So let's talk about some of the myths about communication and conflict. Conflict is just miscommunication. Nope, it usually has more to do with competing goals or incompatible goals. All conflicts can be resolved through good communication. Nope, not all conflicts can be resolved through communication or any other means. And it is always best to talk through conflicts. Now, if one person in the conflict is not an effective communicator, then trying to talk about it will not be helpful because nothing will be solved. So one person being a complete uh, jerk is not going to benefit the person who's an excellent communicator. So we have various kinds of conflict. We have image conflict. This is when the conflict with another about how we perceive one another. You might be shocked to find out a friend is racist or a friend is a different political party than you are or they have a different perspective on religion than you do. Then there's content or substantive conflict which revolves around public or private issues. You might support one candidate and your friend supports a totally different candidate in a presidential election. Value conflict caused by seeing something as right or wrong. So for example, you might be pro-choice but your family is anti-abortion. We all have different values that we have developed in our lives based on not just where we come from in our families but by the experiences that we've had. Some people grow up in a family where you know women are expected to be submissive and listen to men and that made them grow up to become more independent and less likely to become dependent on the men in their lives. Then we have relational conflict and this focuses on issues concerning the relationship between two people. So for example, your spouse never remembers your wedding anniversary or one member of the uh, relationship wants to have sex more often than the other one, which is one of the major reasons uh, people in marriages fight. Then we have meta-conflict, which results from the way a conflict is conducted. So your coworker throws things and screams, which creates a bigger problem than the original conflict. How you fight can be the problem in and of itself. So some people, they want to get their peace out in five or ten minutes, get cranky, throw a little fit, and then go to their corner and calm down. Other people want to hash it out for three hours and fight and fight and fight. And if those kind of people hook up, they are not going to have compatible conflict styles. Then we have serial conflict. And this recurs over time in people's everyday lives without a resolution. 
We often see this with adult siblings who constantly bicker over the same thing since childhood. So the big sister is bossy, the little brother is a slacker, and so on and so forth. So here's an um, conflict dialogue. Andre, it's a real shame that all these states are legalizing medical marijuana. People will abuse the system and get prescriptions even if there's nothing wrong with them. Drugs are illegal for a reason. And then Michael says, I really thought I knew you, Andre, but that just blew me away. Alcohol and tobacco are legal and they're much more harmful than marijuana. With proper regulation, marijuana can be a beneficial treatment for a number of illnesses. So we can see multiple um, conflicts going on. We have values. How should substances be controlled? Content conflict. Should medical marijuana be legal? Relational conflict. Can we still be friends though we disagree? An image conflict. Did we really know each other well? So you have multiple conflicts within one particular argument. And this is where you see the issue of conflict being so much bigger than what we might originally think it is. So what factors influence conflict? A big one is gender roles. Some of us were taught to use certain conflict techniques because society has deemed particular behaviors acceptable for each gender. For example, some males are taught always stand up to someone and if you have to fight, then fight. If you learn this as a child, some men use assertive conflict modes versus using cooperative modes, meaning that if you're taught by your dad that if someone gives you a hard time, your option is to get aggressive with them, you believe that is the appropriate way to handle conflict. Alternative, alternatively, in many families, females are taught to be the peacemaker and the one who comforts others. So women are more likely to use the cooperative mode versus using a conflict mode. So you don't see a lot of women throwing down and getting into fist fights. Now, of course, in some arenas, you do see women getting into what we like to call cat fights, where there's hair pulling and nails scratching and all that kind of stuff. And there's all kinds of videos on YouTube showing these videos. And, you know, one of the reasons that we're all so titillated by them is because they are fairly rare. Whereas two guys beating the snot out of each other is pretty normal and, you know, been there, done that. We've all seen it. Then we have self-conflict. How we think and feel about ourselves affect how we approach conflict. So do we think our beliefs, feelings, and opinions are worth being heard by the person with whom we are in conflict? You know, somebody who has a very low self-conflict is not going to stand up for themselves and you know define what is bothering them. Then there are expectations. Do we believe that the other person wants to resolve the conflict? You know there are situations where we realize the other person doesn't care. They don't want to resolve the conflict. The situation is not important to them so they're quite happy moving on with their day. Then we have communication skills. How well the two people who are engaged in the conflict can explain their perspective and listen to the other person's perspective will often determine how quickly the conflict can be resolved. If both people have very good communication sk skills, conflict can be resolved very quickly. If both people have very poor communication skills, the conflict may, may never be resolved. So these are the elements that really can influence the resolution process to conflict. Another aspect is the situation. Where is the conflict taking place? 
you know, if it's in the office, it'll probably be a little bit less um, argumentative than if it's in a bar or at home. Do we know the person we are in conflict with? If some stranger knocks into you and spills your drink, you might be more belligerent than if somebody at a party at your house knocks into you and you know that person. Um, and you're like, oh, sorry, no bad, you know, no problem. Um, and is the conflict personal or professional? Professional conflicts most of us are willing to blow off because we don't really care that much. Whereas a personal conflict is much more important to us because our hearts are in it. Then we have a power status. What is the power relationship between the two people engaged in the conflict? Is there equality or is someone subordinate to the other? So a parent or a child or a boss or an employee, this power status makes the relationship much more um, subordinate in terms of you know a child is only going to push back so much and test the waters so much especially if the parent is very authoritarian and they know there are going to be consequences if they get under the skin of their mom and dad same thing with the boss and employee you're only going to push so much if you know your boss could fire you and you can't lose your job then we have life experiences. Various life events can have a very potent impact on how we manage conflict. For example, someone who's experienced abuse as a child may be hypersensitive to conflict and avoid it to the point of never speaking up for oneself for fear of being retaliated against. Um, you know, that PTSD, you know, that post traumatic stress is very um, significant and people are very willing to subordinate their own sense of justice in order to avoid being yelled at or hit or punished in some way. Then there's culture. Certain cultures encourage a more conflict oriented mode than a compromise oriented mode. So in the United States we love our conflict, you know, get get up there and you want to fight until you win and then in Japan especially since the end of World War II compromise orientation has been the defining aspect and you know that whole idea of fighting to win has really um, been a subordinate subordinated idea in preference to let's have everybody walk away from the table with a win then we have relationship history and this is again part of the history of any relationship every prior conflicts prior conflict affects how a future conflict will be handled so if you had in your teenage relationship your first time you fell in love and the conflict that you had with your first love muffin uh, was handled well and you would talk things out and then you'd make up and everything was all warm and fuzzy well that's going to affect how you handle your conflict in the future because you believe that conflict can be resolved and things will be better it will affect your future relationship and shape all the relationship you have in your life on the other side of the coin if your first relationship was handled terribly and the conflict was horrible and you know it ended up with you leaving and slamming the door and not coming back then every subsequent relationship every time there's conflict you might walk out the door and never stick around to see if you can fix it so a lot of these factors you might recognize in your own conflict style and you have to understand that recognizing that you may or may not handle conflict well is the first thing in terms of understanding how to improve your conflict management style. So there are five ways of dealing with conflict. Competing, obliging or smoothing, compromising, avoiding, integrating or collaborating. 
So let's talk about competing. This is when you have a need to promote your own needs over the needs of others. So it's all about you, 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 and you. It relies on an aggressive style of communication, low regard for future relationships, and the exercise of coercive power. Tend to seek control over discussion in both substance and ground rules. And, you know, kind of if you think of it as uh, being a bully in a sense, you know, the guy or the girl who is going to get it their way and only their way and they don't care what you think because it's going to be their way. They fear the loss of such control will result in solutions that fail to meet their needs. Because remember, it's not about what the group needs, it's about their needs. Competing tends to result in responses that increase the level of aggressiveness. So, you know, you see a little red light there. That's not a great style for, com for any kind of conflict. And if this is the style that you work with, this is a big no-no. You need to start backing off of this kind of conflict style. Then we have the obliging conflict style, which is also known as smoothing. This has a low concern for yourself and a high concern for others. And again, you might see this as being, you know, a, a loving person who's always going to sacrifice your personal issues to satisfy the concerns of the other party. Well, it's actually your self-sacrificing and neglecting your own needs for someone else and that's not always going to be a good thing. This style is non-confrontational and characterized by minimizing differences and emphasizing commonalities to satisfy the concerns of the other party, meaning you don't get anything that you want. And it's more focused on maintaining a good relationship. A, an obliging person can be defined as a conflict absorber reacting with friendliness to a perceived hostile act. They're like the sponge. They just take all that hostility and they absorb it and they try to make things better. It's that, oh, don't worry, it's okay, we'll make it better, we'll make it better. Meanwhile, you know, they're dealing with somebody who's maybe a competing conflict style and they're bullying their way to get their way and the obliger is going to let them get their way. So again, we have a red light on this telling us this is not a good style either. Then we have the compromise style. This approach allows people to gain and to give in a series of trade-offs. While satisfactory, compromise is generally not always satisfying. We each remain shaped by our individual perceptions of our needs and don't necessarily understand the other side very well. So we often retain a lack of trust and avoid risk-taking involved in more collaborative behaviors. So compromise is better than competing or obliging, but it's still not the best. So we're going to give this a yellow light. Then we have avoiding. So this is the classic, if we don't bring it up, it'll blow over. Let's cover our eyes and we won't see it. We cover our ears, we won't hear about it. Generally, all that happens is that feelings get pent up, views go unexpressed, and the conflict festers until it becomes too big to ignore. The conflict grows and spreads until it kills the relationship. Because the needs and concerns go unexpressed, people are often confused wondering what went wrong in the relationship. And be it whether personal or professional, people don't really get it. Avoiding is a really bad conflict style. So we're going to give that a red light. Don't do it. Woo woo, we got a green light. Integrating and collaboration. This style is characterized by a high concern for yourself and for others. It involves collaboration between the parties that are willing to reach a mutual and exceptional, or sorry, acceptable solution through openness, exchange of information, examination, 
and exploration of differences for arriving to a constructive solution. Obviously, this is not going to be an easy process, but it is the most effective conflict style. Now, one of the issues that we often don't think about with conflict, but is one of the real issues that come along with conflict, is that the emotions that are associated with conflict. We have fear and anxiety that comes because we're a little bit afraid of conflict, and we sometimes feel in a real or imagined threat, especially from someone who's in the competing conflict style. Anger results because we have this sense of justice that is not being met by the actual events. We oftentimes feel guilt, shame, and contempt because we have this result that between a desirable standard of behavior and the actual behavior doesn't come together. Um, envy and jealousy result between what you want and what you get. You know, you wanted to get this particular promotion. You don't get it because somebody else in the department got it because they lied, cheated, and basically stole your promotion. So, of course, you know, that conflict is there. When you blame another for causing conflict, you may come to hate them. And then you have ambivalence describes a conflict within yourself, an inability to choose a clear goal or direction when you feel indecisive. So you get all of these emotions and all of these emotions erupt and cause us to feel even worse about the conflict. So then we see certain patterns and these patterns are important to identify because they really do tell us where we are within the conflict um, pattern. So we have the symmetrical escalation when each partner chooses to increase the intensity of the conflict. So you're home with your love muffin, you're having a conversation, your love muffin disagrees with you, you disagree with your love muffin, they start yelling, you start yelling, and then before you know it, you're both yelling and screaming at each other and threatening to leave, and it gets escalated beyond belief. Then you have symmetrical withdrawal, which is when neither of the partners are willing to confront each other. That's when, you know, you have this conversation, you're like, yo, I don't want to get into a fight, so I'm going to go out for a jog, and your love muffin says, well, great, because I'm going to go see my mom and drop off some rolls or something. Then we have positive to negative ratios which affect relationships significantly. You have your positive interaction ratio and this is when po participants say more positive things to each other than negative things. I know you're going to be shocked but this is a much better option than a negative interaction ratio, which is when participants say more negative things to each other than positive things. It is far, far better to avoid the negativity than to thrive on the negativity. We have pursuit withdrawal. When one party presses for a discussion about a conflictual topic while the other party withdraws. And then you have withdrawal pursuit, which is basically the same thing as pursuit withdrawal, but opposite. One party withdraws, which prompts the other party to pursue. So you don't want to talk about it. Your love muffin does. So you say, you know what, I'm going for a walk, and they follow you. Then you have symmetrical negotiation, which is each party mirrors the other's negotiating behaviors. So if you're calm, your negotiating partner stays calm. If you get all energetic and fighting and just losing it, then the other person gets all fighting and loses it. So, you know, these kinds of conflict patterns really do tell us how much we can control our own behavior within the conflict that we're engaged in. 
we have destructive interpersonal conflict. Um, and these are devices that just don't make things better. They just make things worse. Placating. And this is being passive or ignoring one's own needs. And then pouncing. Responding in an aggressive manner without acknowledging the needs of another person. And, you know, and again, this idea of, you know, attacking someone while they're just sitting there watching TV. And they're like, what? Wait, when did I do that? What did I do? And they have no idea that you've been boiling inside of your own head and that you're ready to attack. Then you have computing, which is disqualifying the emotional aspects and focusing only on the rational aspects. This is when somebody discounts your feelings and goes only looking at the facts. Then you have distractions. This is disqualifying the subject by distracting people with certain behaviors. Laughing, crying, changing the subject. And you know, people sometimes do cry because they know it'll make somebody else feel really bad and that'll stop the fight. Is it a bad thing to do? Yes. Is it a technique people use? Yes. Because sometimes it's the only way to get someone to stop yelling. And again, you know, these are not good conflict resolution strategies, but they're used. And we have to understand that they're not good. They are destructive. We're also going to talk about conflict and power because conflict at its core is about defining who has the ability to determine the rules to make one set the behavior of another, to control the behavior of another. So using power during the conflict Direct application, use of resources at disposal to compel another to comply, regardless of that person's desires. You know, using blackmail or physical force. Um, virtual use, communicating the potential use of direct application. So a threat of physical force, a threat of secrets being revealed. You know, those threats are sometimes more frightening than the actual physical force. Indirect application, which is employing power without making its employment explicit. And this is often used in terms of a relational message. Defines a relationship and impl implicitly states that the sender has the power to do so. So, for example, being called into the manager's office to discuss your lack of productivity. There's no discussion about you being fired, but you're aware it's a possibility. So, you know, once you get called into the boss's office, it's always a little nerve-wracking. Then there's hidden or unobtrus unobtrusive power. And this is when one person in a relationship suppresses or avoids decisions in the interest of one of the parties. And this is, you know, sometimes done to try and help you feel better. So, for example, your mom and dad are getting divorced, but they don't tell you until after your birth, so you won't feel sad. So, ideally, the idea here is that, you know, they're trying to protect you, but they're also, you know, hiding the conflict. They hold the power so they're hiding it. Then there's also the fact that there's a lot of gender differences, especially in marital conflict. Women tend to demand things, men tend to withdraw. And this is because there's a power difference. Wives desire more change and therefore demand, whereas husbands desire less change and withdraw to maintain the status quo. And this results from social conventions that give men greater power and women less power. So what is the best option? Constructive interpersonal conflict. It leads to positive evaluations of communication and competence, increases knowledge of one another and exposes feelings, promotes feelings of confidence and relationships, 
promotes genuine human contact, increases the depth of a relationship, and maximizes the chance of making a good decision. So, this will finish up today's presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to text or email me. Um, we will next week go over conflict resolution, which is the second part of Chapter 9. And I hope you have an awesome day. Thank you.